Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today at the COVID-19 scientific track. My name is Sarah Warren and I'm the Senior Director of Translational Science at Nanostring and I'll be your moderator for this session. Spatial profiling with the Geomix platform can be highly informative as it allows a simultaneous interrogation of the viral pathogenesis, subsequent disease resolution and immune response. In this track, we will highlight results from a number of studies that apply geomics profiling to tissues from COVID patients and show how DSP complements, informs, and guides other profiling modalities. A panel discussion with the presenters will address outstanding questions for the COVID research community and how COVID studies can drive technology advances that will benefit all research areas. The speakers presenting in this track are Alan Borzak and, and Rob Schwartz from Cornell uh, Medical School. Alan's a pathologist, Rob's a hepatologist there. Asa Stegelstorp, a research scientist at the Broad Institute. Gordon Jang, an assistant professor of medicine at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center. And David Ting, a physician and researcher at Massachusetts General Hospital. Following the presentations, I'll rejoin the group and start the roundtable discussion. A quick note of housekeeping, if any questions arise during the presentations, we encourage you to submit them via the Q&A box and we'll respond to your questions by email. Now, please join me in welcoming all of our speakers and I will be handing it over first to Alan Borza. Thank you, Sarah. And thank you for the opportunity to share uh, the work that uh, Rob and I have uh, done here at Wild Cornell. Uh, we're going to be talking about uh, COVID-19 respiratory distress sy syndrome and using your platform uh, specifically with the goal of dissecting the root cause of the severity of this disease. Uh, we'll be going through the following outline um, and we will uh, uh, share uh, in the middle, I will transition over to, to, to Rob. I'm going to focus in on the pathologic features and the banking components. So for us, acute respiratory distress syndrome and pathology goes through phases. And we see those phases um, usually as a day zero and progression uh, through epithelial cell death um, and eventual healing in the lung. Um, we see those stages and we are fairly confident about the resolution of these phases based upon a time of injury and a progression over several days where initially there are features of cell death and necrosis followed by inflammation and increasing amount of regeneration and eventual fibrosis. A typical COVID-19 respiratory distress syndrome case showed all these features of diffuse alveolar damage. What's interesting and what we found in many cases was that in addition to the type two cell hyperplasia of regeneration uh, seen uh, at around five to seven days after injury and simultaneously a robust, robust interstitial fibroblastic proliferation at 10 to 14 days, we simultaneously saw new injuries, and those injuries in the form of hyaline membranes and necrosis, which we would have expected uh, at two to three days. And so these were side by side. And what we found in looking at a large cohort, this of 68 patients from Wild Cornell, Mount Sinai, and uh, Italy, was that while we expected things like type two pneumocyte hyperplasia, fibroblast organizing pneumonia, and squamous metaplasia to increase in frequency with days of illness, we also found an unexpected thing that necrosis also increased by days of disease. For many folks, this meant superimposed injuries, that is oxygen toxicity or low blood pressure or perhaps superinfection as a cause. But leveraging immunohistochemistry and in situ hybridization, what we found was something not exactly what we expected, which is that these techniques showed viral immuno and viral RNA in areas of those new injuries. And importantly, that there were really three groups that we were identifying. The first group had acute viral injury in the first week, and in red are a positive both by immuno and by in situ. But then we saw a second group in which there was an acute on subacute viral injury in which we were still able to detect virus in the lung. And surprisingly, this was still present in three of our cases at four weeks. I want to point out that our experience now is up to 46 autopsy cases, um, and this is a subset of them, um, but that there was a third group in which virus was no longer detectable in the lung, but that you can see all these little symbols next to the numbers where the patients really had either a comorbid condition, secondary pneumonias, or strokes, or other causes of death. So importantly, these patients in group three 
that were in a healing phase of lung injury, they died of either lung disease, fibrosis, superinfection, but we were not able to find virus in these patients. And you can see this takes us out to over six weeks of illness as well. So in addition to those epithelial findings, we found thrombosis. And in these patients, we found large vessel thrombosis, as well as small microthrombi, and in the panel on the lower right, immunohistochemistry for CD61 showing uh, thrombosis in, in the capillary bed. And so what we found was that at, in these autopsies that this respiratory distress syndrome is a heterogeneous disease, that we saw cases for sure in a large proportion, especially within the first four weeks, of a mixture of direct viral infection, and we also saw the effect of some systemic reaction in the form of thrombosis. And so we were starting to divide this heterogeneity into both viral versus non-viral injuries in the epithelial compartment, as well as the effect of vascular injury in the vascular compartment to account for these simultaneous events in both epithelium and vascular bed. I, we, we had at our disposal uh, some tissues from these cases because in the beginning when the uh, pandemic really hit New York, uh, we were quite resource limited. But because of good coordination and great collaboration, we were able to use the best resource we could for autopsies. We did not uh, obtain brain tissue. We did not freeze tissue because of safety concerns. But we did, in fact, put tissue in trisol for RNA extraction, in urea for protein extractions, and also formalin fixation for tissue sections. And this all occurred really, I, I call it pop-up banking, because we really did this on the fly and with great personal effort on the part of, of the collaborators. And so for us, a, a choice of a spatial transcriptomics platform ideally would work in paraffin, would tolerate the less optimal fixation times that we get at autopsy, so RNA integrity is not going to be perfect. And we would want to be able to interrogate the alveolar, the airway, and the vascular compartments, if not separately, at least in a way that we could deconvolute and that we could also incorporate analysis of viral message to see whether it localized to these areas of injury. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Rob to take, to take in, in the next part of the presentation. Um, well, Alan, thank you again uh, very much for that, um, for that um, transition and for that introduction on COVID-19 and our efforts here um, on, on this pr um, project. Now, as many of you are aware, COVID-19 has many open questions. Um, you know, I'm, a few of these are just illustrated here. For example, are there different distinct stages of COVID-19 induced lung injury and disease, which I think Alan addressed very nicely earlier that based on histology, there, f there appears to be um, at least three, if not more, phases that are ongoing during this disease process. But it is very hard just looking at the histology here without a deeper analysis to really know the characterization of this injury and to try to understand how this injury process differs um, from other viral infections such as flu, how this differs from a other ARDS or acute respiratory distress syndrome injury processes to know which cell types are present within COVID-19 lung disease as compared to normal lung and injured lung, and to know whether or not the spatial organization of cells and their uh, relative gene expression is altered in COVID-19 relative to these other disease processes. So as Alan um, already uh, mentioned, there's a lot of advantages to using a spatial uh, approach for this type of analysis. And actually, I'm just gonna jump ahead here um, because the first thing we actually did is we used Encounter um, to actually evaluate this material due to concern whether or not um, the tissue quality after autopsy would be robust enough for analyzing in this type of fashion. And what we were quite um, happy to see is that the encounter system and method of analysis really did uh, show that there was maintenance of RNA integrity and that we can see quite profound differences um, between um, basically um, virally infected with COVID 
um, samples and then non-virally infected samples that came from COVID patients, but who we had evidence had, that they had already cleared the infection. And you can see here that um, in relative to patients that have flu versus COVID, um, that there's a quite a different differential expression of genes that are overrepresented in patients who had had COVID or in patients who had only had flu. So now with that said, um, basically, you know, our objective was to see and characterize the lung tissues that were collected post-mortem from patients that um, had COVID-related ARDS, who had ARDS through flu, who had a non-viral form uh, or induced ARDS, and then um, who had normal lung. And so basically um, these samples um, were analyzed from at least three patients um, with, um, from each group in these four indicated conditions. So a total of um, 16 total were analyzed. The samples, as we mentioned, were from uh, formal and fixed paraffin embedded blocks, and they all were cut very soon prior to their uh, analysis. And the profiling that was done with uh, nanostring was using the, uh, uh, the CTA uh, atlas with the addition of a COVID uh, spiking, spike in and additional genes that we would feel would be um, overrepresented in uh, lung tissue. So these samples were sent to um, Nanostring, and basically we actually then analyzed a variety of different ROIs or regions of interest on these samples, either large airway or vascular zones or velar zones or the immune infiltrate zones, which in the majority of these were uh, macrophages. And so this kind of gives you an idea of what at least a normal t uh, COVID um, you know, analysis, but from normal tissue, what we see, and we did an analysis for PAN-CK and the different immune cells. And you can see that's represented here and helped guide us as we did uh, and analyzed and picked these different regions of interest. So basically, after that was uh, completed, the sites uh, were, went through the nanostring pipeline. The uh, different regions of interest were essentially illuminated. Library prep sequencing and data analysis was done from these uh, different um, areas. And um, basically, you can see here um, the the um, the different um, zones and the types of genes that were uh, represented within these zones, either being from the alveolar, the large airway vascular, or um, from um, the immune component zones. And basically the majority of these zones contained enough uh, RNA such that we only lost a few of the ROIs that were analyzed either to low reads or uniqueness. Now, interestingly, um, when we when we when the analysis was done, you can see that the normal and flu samples actually cluster um, well together, while the COVID samples seem to have a lot more variability, as well as did the ARDS samples. And while initially this was surprising to us, maybe this sort of makes sense given the broad heterogeneity and diversity that might be represented or would be represented within the ARDS samples and in the COVID samples. Um, what we then, um, the analysis was performed looking at differential gene expression analysis comparing the COVID-19 samples versus flu, the COVID-19 samples versus the non-viral samples, and the COVID-19 samples versus the normal samples. And you can see actually that one of the most differentially expressed genes um, uh, with COVID-19 versus flu and COVID-19 versus normal was this gene NR4A1. And um, right now we are, are still trying to you know, figure out the role that this gene may, uh, that this gene family may be playing a role and what this is signifying uh, to us. Um, there are other a variety of gene families that were also um, overrepresented. And basically that is uh, shown here. And you know, what we see here is, is that not unsurprisingly, um, that cytokine, cytokine signaling for, uh, from the immune system was one of the most overrepresented um, gene, you know, gene pathway family networks, as well as interleukin signaling, um, signaling by interleukins, TNF alpha signaling and others. And that um, obviously there are a variety of different uh, gene pathways that were also down, uh, down regulated as well. Um, 
And these are seem to be more related to um, fibrosis and things along these lines, which is not surprising again, given the amount of fibrosis and how rich um, uh, in um, uh, fibrosis and scar is seen in these uh, COVID-19 samples. Um, now, this is when we're comparing COVID-19 to, uh, to flu. When we're, uh, when we're comparing COVID-19 just to kind of generic ARDS, we actually again see this overrepresentation of interleukin signaling, um, TNF alpha signaling, and cytokine signaling, which basically tells us that even when we compare directly to, let's say, flu, which is a viral illness, or ARDS, which is caused from a non-viral etiology, that even in these contexts, there is a significant overrepresentation of um, interleukins and in TNF alpha signaling, even though these other diseases are either caused in one context from viral causes or in the other, just representative of the kind of this overall lung injury process. The other component that we've seen in the pathology that's represented here in this analysis was, you know, basically the overrepresentation of neutrophils. This has been reported by many groups. It, it's something that we've seen on our histology, and it's also something that we see represented here as well. Now, I think one of the amazing um, uh, analysis tools that can be done here is basically single cell deconvolution based on the gene expression um, that is performed. And it basically allows an analysis to essentially determine the abundance and types of the cells that are present. Now, I know this is a very busy slide. We're not going to dig deeply into this, but you know, just pointing out that you can actually deconvolute this. And you can see in the, um, in the COVID samples, you see a significant overrepresentation of, of basically uh, macrophages and neutrophils um, as compared to just generic ARDS and, and the flu samples. And that's just really denoted here kind of in this um, you know, orange grouping of color. You know, if we basically, because we know where this, the, the ROIs are obtained in space on these samples, you can actually see and then map where these cells are in representation on those ROIs within the specific tissues themselves. And you can see, you know, the specific groupings and um, of these um, within the specific tissues themselves for macrophages, monocytes, neutrophils, fibroblasts, DCs, and T cells. And, you know, if you really just focus specifically on the macrophage, macrophages in space, you really see that they're not present in normals. Um, you know, we see this on the nostalgia that's represented here as well, and it basically is, confirms this data. Um, basically, you know, the, the last thing that was done was just using RNA scope just to kind of confirm, you know, tempers 2 staining, you know, the viral staining, things like this. And, you know, basically, we, we actually see significant alterations in this. And I'm just showing you here the data for tempers too. Um, we really see loss of some of the other targets as well. It, you know, keep in mind, this is after, and this is an autopsy too, after infection. And this is, uh, has been confirmed by, uh, by stainings as well by us and others. So I think the data is very consistent, um, but it's really led us to have a much deeper resolution as well as cellular characterization. This is just showing you some of the pictures here uh, showing um, the expression of, of tempers 2 with just the low-level expression that we have within our tissues. Um, you know, basically, you know, low in, in, in you know, the alveoli um, in some of the tissues, but high in others. And I think this is just representative of some of the different disease states or the presentations that we see within our, our patient panel. So these are just two different patients where we see this um, similarity um, from patient 17 to 21, but in the initial sample where we see low expression. Um, this is similarly shown in flu, where we actually see high representation of tempers 2 through almost all the samples. Again, showing that there's more variability present within the COVID samples. So, you know, I know I just kind of ran through this data somewhat quickly, but just concluding here on the geomix data here in the COVID samples, where, you know, I think what we've shown you here today is a very large autopsy cohort consisting of COVID-19 related ARDS, Influenza, a different virus related ARDS, non viral ARDS, um, and then just normal, like liver, uh, normal lung tissue. We use Encounter just to characterize these tissues 
um, to make sure that what we're seeing is, you know, for, that the, the tissue itself would, would be enough quality to actually continue with the genomics analysis. What we found was the tissues overall were of good quality. And I think this was confirmed in the downstream genomics analysis where good data was able to be generated. I mean, clustering differential gene expression analysis shows that samples in the COVID and ARDS samples are heterogeneous, while samples in the normal flu groups are actually rather homogeneous. And that specific gene and gene networks were upregulated and overrepresented in both these analyses. You know, RNA scope was used to confirm some of this data and it showed that TEMPERS2 was highly expressed in the large airways in some of the alveolar zones, but was very quite variable among the COVID samples. And that quantitative single cell deconvolution results showed that different cell types in the COVID and ARDS samples are more variable than those in the normal flu groups. But with that said, was consistent with the um, overrepresentation of certain cell groups um, as compared to the histology that we performed previously. And then finally, I just want to recognize, obviously, this has been a team effort here. I want to credit uh, my collaborator, Alan Borchek, who really uh, did uh, enormous efforts to help assemble and do um, these autopsies. A, a variety of people in my lab, specifically Yon Brahm, Dequin, Vasu, Chandar, and then uh, former people in my lab, uh, Angie Frankel and Jumun Park, my variety of cl uh, my collaborators, and uh, my funding sources for this work. And with that said, um, I will pass this off to our moderators uh, as we move forward um, in these talks and we'll gladly take questions uh, at the end of, uh, of this uh, seminar. And our next speaker will be Dr. David Ting from Massachusetts General Hospital speaking about temporal spatial heterogeneity of the host response to SARS-CoV-2 pulmonary infection. Thank you, Dr. Ting. Thank you, Nana String and Sarah for having me here. Um, I'm very excited to be telling you about the work that we've been doing at the Massachusetts General Hospital. I am an oncologist by training. And uh, when this pandemic hit, we, uh, we decided to use uh, our, our resources and knowledge to, to try to help understand uh, uh, the SARS-CoV-2 uh, lung infection. And uh, as a clinician, you know, I could say uh, first and foremost, uh, being on the wards, uh, taking care of COVID-19 patients, that this is a, a terrible disease uh, that we really uh, are working together with uh, our academic as well as corporate collaborators to really understand uh, better ways of diagnosing and treating this disease. So, you know, the, the project really started with uh, autopsies that were being analyzed at the Massachusetts General Hospital. We were uh, processing these carefully as uh, they were uh, at high risk for, for infection for our staff. But we were able to get our protocols through to uh, evaluate FFPE material as uh, has been highlighted by my other speakers. Uh, we did 24 autopsies that were SARS-CoV-2 QRT-PCR confirmed cases from the nasopharyngeal diagnostic uh, biops uh, uh, analysis. 20 of these were from the Massachusetts General Hospital. Four of them were from Columbia Medical Center in New York City. We analyzed a variety of organs. Uh, we focused on the lungs with three to five lobes per case. Uh, we also analyzed heart, bowel, kidney, liver, fat, bone marrow, and skin. Uh, all of the extrapulmonary samples were negative on RNA-ish, and most of them were negative by RNA sequencing, which we did as a parallel uh, technology. Um, there were two cases of bowel that were low positive by RNA-seq, uh, but we did not see this by RNA-ish. So we don't uh, think that these are active infections in the bowel in these cases. As you can see here, this is the ACD RNA-ish. This is uh, the ish probes directed against the S gene of the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Um, what you can see is the red staining here, prominent um, highland membrane staining. Uh, in the alveoli, as well as intracellular staining in some areas that we believe are pneumocytes. So this demonstrated that uh, not only was there extracellular signal coming from potentially microaspiration of, of uh, virus from the upper airways, but as well as direct infection of uh, pneumocytes in, in, um, in the lungs. What we were able to then do was use a digital image analysis using the HALO platform to uh, quantitate uh, cases that were either low virus or high virus. We know that obviously uh, dichotomization of these uh, particular cases is, 
is just one way of analyzing this, but certainly there's a spectrum of, uh, of different levels of infection across our samples. We then uh, did RNA sequencing as an orthogonal technique as well as QRT-PCR using the CDC-approved uh, QRT-PCR probes. Um, and in fact, we were able to validate our RNA-ish results. And as you can see here, um, we see uh, multiple genes of the virus being expressed uh, and detected by RNA-seq in certain cases. So in case one, we have very high levels. Case nine, we have very high levels. In other cases, like case two and three, we have uh, nearly undetectable virus. And so again, we see this spectrum of high virus cases and low virus cases that indicate that uh, there are potentially two different types of infection, but more likely that what we're seeing is a difference in temporal development of the disease across patients. To assess this, we, we then ask the question, well, if this is true, if, if this is a temporal difference, is there a difference in time between uh, the duration of disease uh, before autopsy? And as what you can see here is that the low virus sample shown here in blue, that they had a longer duration of illness before succumbing to the disease. While our um, high virus cases typically were patients that succumbed to the disease uh, from a, a rapid decline in, in, in pulmonary status. And so what this indicated is that, the, again, as, as others have shown, is that there's probably a, a disease spectrum that represents uh, the temporal development of disease and the evolution of the disease in our patient population. In terms of um, then looking at the RNA-seq data, this is bulk RNA-seq data, we were able to cluster um, based on RNA-seq um, using most variant genes. Um, and what we found was that you could see a large number of viral genes being expressed uh, as expected in our high virus cases. And there are a lot of gene sets that were enriched here that were common, in turn, including interferon gamma and alpha signaling, which was our number one signature, as well as EMT and coagulation. There was this next set that was kind of mixed of high virus and low virus samples. This is more of like an intermediate phase or sort of as the disease is progressing, we believe. We would see indications of wound healing in uh, myogenesis, so the potential scarring or fibrosis of the lungs occurring at this point. Finally, in the low virus cases, again, this would be later in the disease phase, we believe that we're seeing a significant amount of uh, what pneumocyte re regeneration or recovery with increased expression of surfactants, mucin, and keratin genes in this set over here. So when we focused on the, the high cases, what we found was that the interferon gamma response genes were highly enriched. These are multiple interferon gamma response genes shown here the, based on gene set enrichment uh, using M6DB from the Broad. And what you can see is that the interferon signature is much higher in our high virus cases compared to our low virus cases. This is a consistent pattern that was um, seen uh, in our New York samples as well from Columbia. And when we looked at uh, immune cells that may be different, we used CyberSort uh, to deconvolute um, immune cell populations. And what we found was that we could see significant amounts of macrophage signatures across most of our samples, actually, uh, from the high and the low virus samples. But when you use CyberSort, you can sort of differentiate potential M0 sort of state of macrophages as well as M1. And what we would see in our cases is that high virus cases tended to have high M1 macrophage infiltrates, uh, which was statistically significant. We confirmed this with immunohistochemistry just for the macrophages. Uh, we don't have great IHC markers for M1, M2 subtypes. Uh, but again, we see a predominance of CD163 uh, positive macrophages in most of our lung samples, whether they were high or low uh, for the virus. When we focus on the low virus cases in this analysis, uh, by differential expression, we saw significant amounts of surfactant genes, as you can see over here, as well as mucin genes. They were quite heterogeneous in terms of which um, patients were producing surfactant or mucin genes. This could represent differences in timing. This was confirmed by IHC with napsin A, which is a fairly specific marker for the uh, type 2 pneumocyte, as well as keratin which uh, showed that these levels were higher in our virus low samples. And so this would indicate to us that potentially this is a time of recovery of some of the pneumocyte function after uh, initial destruction by the virus in the early phase. 
We then looked at signaling pathways, uh, in particular, JAK2 uh, and STAT1, STAT2 were significantly higher in our high virus cases based on RNA-seq, indicating that these pathways may be important for the initial uh, immune response to the virus. Uh, and this does have some implications for some of the trials that include JAK inhibitors that are ongoing in phase three trials uh, currently. In addition, we looked at IL-22 pathway. There was a recent study showing that CXCR6, uh, which was a, uh, a STIP found in, found in uh, a large GWAS study to be uh, potentially affecting uh, outcomes in patients. And what we saw that there, there was significantly lower amounts of CRCR6 at the expression level on high virus cases compared to low. Uh, of course, this is early data and needs to be confirmed, but suggests that there may be some uh, involvement of IL-22 and CRCR6 pathway activation in uh, COVID-19 infected lungs. So all these uh, initial studies, and these are techniques that we've developed in the lab for cancer research, are, are looking at mostly in the setting of a, a bulk analysis and targeted RNA analysis and tissues. And so we wanted to expand upon this, and we turned to the nanostring genomics platform, which um, is able to look at both proteins and RNAs on FFPE slides in multiple regions of interest. In using the SARS-CoV-2 viral RNA-ish, we could use this to guide our ROI selection for this uh, type of analysis. And here, what you're seeing here is a lung specimen. This is the SARS-CoV-2 probe against the S gene. Um, and as you can see here, we are able to then overlay these RNA-ish images with the genomics images and can select areas that are cytokeratin positive or immune cell positive. Um, that are positive or negative for the SARS-CoV-2 virus. When we looked at regional variations uh, with our uh, colleagues at Nanostring who provided all the uh, infrastructure to do these types of analytics, we, we saw an interesting thing uh, in that different immune responses were actually seen where the virus was. In this first case, we see here in the left upper lobe of case one, we see a predominant monocyte and macrophage infiltrate where the SARS-CoV-2 virus can be detected as shown in red. Uh, while there are some amount of T and NK cells, the prominent infiltrate appears to be macrophage and rich. In the same patient in the left lower lobe, we found a very interesting enrichment of dendritic cells Plasmacytoid cytoid dendritic cells, T cells, and NK cells where the virus is, but a very little monocyte or macrophage infiltrates. This really highlights the intrapatient heterogeneity of the immune response that is important to, um, to understand as a potential uh, thing that we need to consider in the setting of clinical trials. Uh, the other cases that we saw were more consistent with this macrophage monocyte infiltrate with K7 uh, and our other cases showing this uh, infiltrate here. Uh, the very last case over here, case two, is actually a low virus area. And what you can see is there's high macrophage infiltrate areas here uh, with an active virus indicating potentially this is post-resolution of viral clearance, um, but residual macrophage infiltrates in, in our samples. Unsupervised clustering of these regions of interest now, so this is across all the patients and not looking at one single patient. We saw a very clear clustering of two different clusters. The SARS-CoV-2 positive cluster, cluster one, were enriched over here, while the negative controls that we have that were from SARS-CoV-2 negative autopsies, as well as SARS-CoV-2 negative ROIs were enriched in cluster two. Doing differential expression between cluster one and two, we see multiple genes shown in this volcano plot. On the red side, we see CCL15, SSX1 were significantly higher. Uh, and almost outlier, uh, outliers in our SARS-CoV-2 high uh, specimens. When we then looked at those genes, we again saw interferon gene expression highly enriched in our high virus cluster, cluster one. And when you do unsupervised, when you do supervised clustering using the interferon genes, you can sort of see uh, very clearly here that the COVID-19 uh, or SARS-CoV-2 RNA-ish positive areas are overlaying where the interferon response is. And so this uh, really told us that there was a lot of um, focal response. The interferon response is very focal to where the virus is. And this has been an area that people have been debating uh, of whether or not you can actually uh, generate a, a, a large response 
to the virus or if patients actually have defective interferon responses. And when we actually looked at the interferon gene signatures, we saw something that was very interesting at the spatial level. And what you can see here is that uh, the S gene or ORF1 genes of the virus in these high viral cases in case one, uh, you can see that there's a significant amount of certain interferon response genes like C C CXCL10, CXCL9, and ID01 that were very focal to where the virus was. Interesting, it's, interestingly, the MHC genes and the interferon response genes like IFIT3 um, were more diffuse in the lungs, uh, although higher in patients with SARS-CoV-2 virus uh, did not seem to be much higher in the areas where the virus is in the lungs, indicating that the viral response to in, uh, with the interferon response genes is very focal and the types of genes from the interferon response are also focal in those areas. Finally, there's this um, uh, ability to also look at proteins and this is early data just from um, um, some of our initial protein analysis. Um, and as a cancer uh, uh, researcher and oncologist, there are a couple things that stood out to me. One of them was that PDL1, CTLA4, IDO1, and Sting were all uh, somewhat enriched in our high viral cases, indicating that even though we have a robust interferon response with macrophages, uh, there are some immune checkpoints and other immune regulatory proteins that are there that may be suppressing T cell response. This is obviously early data, uh, but this also demonstrates the ability of this platform to uh, see intrapulmonary heterogeneity. So overall, um, in terms of the summary of our work, we really see a temporal correlation of, dur of duration of illness and viral RNA in the lungs. This is consistent with uh, some of my colleagues on this uh, webinar as well. The spectrum of interferon response in high versus low patients is, is quite clear. Uh, and the intrapatient and interpatient heterogeneity that can be seen with uh, the uh, nanostring genomics platform can really show us differences in immune response to the virus. Obviously, this has implications for the timing and patient selection for antivirals and our immune modulating therapies as we think about trials that are ongoing in, in future trials. And I hope that we can identify protein and RNA markers with um, my colleagues in infectious disease and, and, and basic science and, uh, and clinical um, uh, microbiology to sort of identify ways of uh, pro you know, providing new therapeutic interventions for these patients. As I say, you know, these things uh, often take a village, but in this case, this took a metropolis. We had uh, great collaborators internally at the MGH, as well as at Columbia academically, Nanostring, the Broad Institute, ACD. Um, and without all of these people working together, there was no way we would be able to accomplish this so quickly. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, David, that was wonderful. Uh, our next presenter will be uh, Dr. Asa Seikelstorp. She will be speaking about the spatial insights of lung pathology in COVID-19 autopsies. Thank you, Sarah, for the nice introduction. Yes, I am very happy to be invited to this conference and to speak here. Um, so we have been very fortunate at the Broad Institute to be able to team up with three larger Boston area hospitals. And together, we have been able to run multiple COVID-19 related research projects. Uh, but for this presentation, I would like to focus on the autopsy organ cohort that we have, both from COVID-19 patients as well as healthy references. And from these tissues, we have run single cell, single nuclei, RNA-seq, and also spatial analysis with the nanostring platform. Uh, this table here shows the 17 autopsy atlas study donors that we have included in this study. And you can also see the number of different tissue types that we have from each individual. We also have a wide variety of ages from 30 to up to 90 years old uh, people. And they have had multiple different organ failures and uh, they have been intubated for certain amounts of days. And we have some PMI times there as well for the single cell studies. Um, the autopsy profiling objectives have been mainly three. So we, the first one is to atlas the deceased tissues 
in detail on single cell level. And then we would like to compare the disease versus healthy tissue and look for the changes in cell composition. And third, we want to also study the infected cell types and what induced gene expression programs there are and what cell-cell interactions are changed upon viral infection. Um, so the spatial arm of this cohort uh, was done on FFP material from larger tissue sections. And from these 17 autopsies, four of them were assayed with the nanostring genomics DSP platform, as well as the RNA scope assay. And in total, we have nine COVID-19 diseased subjects and three controlled non-infected lungs. And this um, start of the project, we focused on the lung and especially the left upper lung lobe of the distal part of the lung. And this was basically because we had a lot of single nuclei, single cell sequencing already done on this region. And in the table here, you see the nine COVID patients and their different ages, organ failures, and also the length of disease they've had. So it's very variable there. And um, we got all these samples from Brigham and Women Hospital and where they have done an initial immunohistochemistry of the viral levels of these patients. And they found that three were negative on uh, immunohistochemistry. Three had low positive le levels of virus, whereas Two were moderately positive and one very highly positive. Um, we have been using three different assays from the nanostring genomics platform to assay these samples. Both uh, we use the cancer transcriptomic atlas, the CTA, and also added in the COVID spiking probes. We have also used the whole transcriptome atlas, which is 1800 or 18,000 transcripts, so covering all different pathways, as well as using the COVID spiking probes. And third, we use the protein assay for immuno-oncology, a 78 am amino antibody protein assay, and also added in the COVID protein modules with a spike protein and temporous ACE2 catepsin and an RNA helicase called DDX5. And our goal was to try and assay ROIs or to match our eyes over different, these different assays on consecutive slides. Um, we started by initially screening these samples with the RNA scope probe uh, towards the SARS-CoV-2 genome. And we also used then for morphology staining, we used the epithelial morpho morphology marker pan cytokeratin and also CD45 staining. And we did RNA ROI placement with the help of a pathologist doing this online with us live. And uh, the ROI bay areas we selected was based on the signal we had on the SARS COVID from the RNA scope slides. And we also had the pathological assessment and annotation while we were placing the ROIs. And we mainly have focused on alveoli but also we have taken airways, blood vessels, glands, etc. And we have sampled around 200 regions of interest across all samples per assay. And the ROI were segmented, most of them, with the pansy K. So we have around 200 pansy K negative regions and 130 pansy K positive segments sequenced per assay. Uh, next, I'm going to show you some slides of example of patients. So some of these were negative on immunohistochemistry for the virus. And we also see that to the right here, you see the RNA uh, scope slides. We also see no signal for the virus in these samples. And over to the left, you see the pansy KCD45 staining and the ROI placement we took there. So we have eight alveoli, two airway, and four blood vessels collected for this particular sample. <clears throat> Here is another example of a patient with moderate positive immunohistochemistry level for the virus. And with RNA scope, you can also see that we have very regional differences, as many of the previous speakers have already mentioned. We have regional differences of viral load in the lung lobes. 
and this enables the ROA placement to, we can capture areas of both high and low COVID rates. Um, yes. Uh, this third sample here is the, the sample which were highly positive for the virus. And it's a 68 year old with um, COPD, which had lung and heart failure. And we were able to collect ROIs from both the RNA scope slide as well as the Pansy KCD45 stain slide. So we have 23 ROIs in total collected for both of these slides. And we tried to match the ROIs as closely as we could. And here you can also see the regional differences in viral signal on the RNA scope slide. Here are some ROI zoom ins of different regions. And you can see up in green on the top, we have the Pansy K signal, which is very positive for the virus, shown in red to the right. And here you also see the segmentation profile, segmentation masks that we used for these samples to collect. And to the right on the lower panel, you can see also the CD45 signal that we have tried to ramp up here. We have not really been able to use this antibody. Uh, it's been hard to, to segment on, and yeah, we, we don't have really specific staining of the CD45, unfortunately. So we have mostly done PAN-CK segmentation on our ROIs. Um, Another thing that was interesting, so we could group our ROIs into regions of either very low COVID expression, medium, and high. And this down in the histogram here, you can see also the nanostring probes for the spike proteins and the ORF1AB viral genome. And we can, to the left, you see all the pan-CK negative segments, and they have been ordered from negative, medium to high. COVID concentrations for the RNA scope slide. And you can also appreciate that for the PANCK positive segments, we see an increase in viral reads over the, when we go from negative to medium to high. So it has a nice correlation, both nanostring data with the RNA scope data. Um, we have also run, of course, differential expression. And first of all, we wanted to study what is the difference between the PANCK positive epithelial cells and the non-epithelial segmented ROIs. And to the right in this volcano plot, you see the log fold change of the, the PANCK positive segments, and where we can see a lot of, of course, epithelial cell markers being enriched, as well as surfactant proteins for the pneumocytes. Uh, but we also see a lot of pro-inflammatory cytokines and chemokines, as well as the spike protein is uh, significantly enriched in these segments of PANCK. Uh, we have also run differential expression between the COVID high versus COVID low region. So in yellow, you see it circled the low COVID regions of the, and this is shown for the RNA scope sample. So we have uh, uh, run differential expression, expression between the six COVID low versus 14 COVID high ROI, so non-segmented this time. And again, uh, or we, we see a high enrichment of the viral reads in the COVID high regions as compared to the COVID low. And in addition, we have a lot of interferon stimulated genes in the COVID high areas as well. Uh, we have done the same differential expression, but here just looking into the PAN-CK positive segments. And again, we see the, the enrichment of the viral transcript in the COVID high regions, as well as pro-inflammatory cytokines and chemokines. Um, interestingly, when we, when we um, look into the differential expression between the COVID high and COVID low regions, in the PAN-CK negative segments, so everything that is non-epithelial cells, we don't see many genes that are significantly different. So meaning that we do have a really focal, um, yeah, the virus is really affecting locally. 
Um, as I told you, we have 12 samples in total. And these are our three control lung parenchyma samples that we have used. We are right now trying to, to analyze all the data from these samples. So and we are trying to do it for both CTA and VTA. But unfortunately, I cannot, I don't have the results yet for the whole cohort. But we are taking around 40 ROIs from the control control groups <clears throat> for both the CTA and VTA. And this slide here shows all the nine COVID patients that has been included and in all the ROI placements. So we have around 150 ROIs, a majority segmented on pansy K positive and negative for both the CTA and VTA assay. And we are planning to take the same for the protein assay. Or we have done that already and we will analyze it on the end counter system. And we have a wide variety of selection of alveoli, bronchial airway, and vessels that we will dig deeper into. I just wanted to end by showing you some data from the single cell, single nuclei RNA-seq cohort from the 17 samples from the same lung region and the different cell types that we collect for these 17 samples. And what you can also see to the right are the viral enrichment of viral counts that we have for the different cell types. So interestingly, we find a lot of viral reads. Well, overall, it's not a lot of viral reads in the single cell data, but the reads we find, they end up in the macrophages, whether this is due to engulfment of apoptotic virally infected cells or whether they're getting infected. It's yeah, something we are looking into. And also in the single cell, single nuclei data, we also find that there is a high variability between patients when it comes to the viral load that we have. So future direction, we are going to, of course, analyze the full data set of the 12 donors across the around 200 collected ROIs that we have for the different segments and correlate gene and protein expression in matched ROIs and run differential expression. Uh, in clinically annotated regions. And then we are planning to use the single cell, single nuclei data to do data deconvolution from matched samples and also run cell compositions per ROI with, with the help of that. And then finally do some cluster analysis of the ROIs. And yes, then I just want to <laughs> end by this an acknowledgement slide. It's a huge cohort or a lot of people involved in these studies. I want to highlight just Aviv Van Orit for leading this project and Sami and Dominic and Malika has been instrumental for the spatial arm to make it work. Bo and Jiming and Joshua has been working on the data analysis and Isaac Solomon has been the person uh, giving us the samples from Brigham and Women. Jonathan Shen and Avinash Wagre are the pathologists that have helped us with the ROI, ROI selection. And also I want to highlight a lot of very good collaborative uh, people at Nanostring that has helped us a lot. Errol, Marty, Priyan, and also you, Sarah. So thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, Rosa. Uh, it was a wonderful presentation. And our next speaker will be Gordon Jang from Beth Israel Deaconess. He's going to be speaking about the transcriptomics of SARS-CoV-2 induced lung injury uh, and telling us about his spatial transcriptomics approach. Thank you, Sora. It's a really a privilege to be invited to this uh, panel of experts on COVID-19 research. Um, so the title of my talk is the transcriptomics of uh, SARS-CoV-2 induced lung injury, a spatial transcriptomics approach. And uh, this is my disclosure and the disclosure I'm not putting into uh, this project. Um, so the disclosure is that uh, um, I am not a pulmonologist. I have never studied a viral biology. Uh, I'm a hepatologist. Um, so I think if anything you can learn from my story is that uh, um, this technology, uh, how this technology can enable an investigator to tap into a new field um, with, uh, with a lot of uh, barriers being overcome um, in this situation. So SARS-CoV-2 you know, has impacted us, everybody um, across the world dramatically. Um, I have been following SARS-CoV-2 
early on in early January. The reason because uh, my wife is actually from Wuhan, and uh, I've been seeing the pandemic unfolding in Wuhan, China, and I've been following that. And um, in March, we start to see cases uh, accumulating uh, in New York and then in Massachusetts as well. Uh, in mid-March, we were told that our lab needs to be closed. And uh, um, early this year, we've been collaborating with uh, NanoString, and we've been thinking about ways to cooperate on projects regarding with the fatty liver disease. Um, but then um, I have to tell them that uh, we cannot do that anymore. Um, so uh, then the idea came up that whether we can use our our resources to work on a project that's uh, SARS-CoV-2 related. And, uh, and here we are. And I just want to show the timeline. This is how the cases uh, increased um, in, in March and April very rapidly. And uh, April the 20th was our first uh, joint meeting that we, we started this project officially. So this is basically uh, supported by a hospital and uh, um, in, 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 a, in, a, in a really a teamwork. So this is the design of our single center study. Um, so we, we're gonna collect the tissues from uh, patients unfortunately succumb to the COVID-19 virus. And uh, we really emphasized on getting the tissue fresh. So we had a interventional radiologist on call and will come in to do uh, ultrasound guided uh, and needle biopsy at different organs within three hours of death. So this really allowed us to minimize the cold ischemia time. Once we have the tissue, we'll do multiple passes of the 16 gauge biopsy. Some of the tissue will be um, fixed and uh, will be used for spatial transcriptomics analysis using the WTA platform. Um, some of the tissues are rapidly flash frozen in liquid nitrogen, and these tissues will then be processed for single nuclear sequencing. And then we're going to combine the uh, analysis and try to try to gain more in-depth information about uh, how the virus impacted the um, host response. And uh, Johannes from our team talked more about the uh, single nuclear sequencing analysis, and I'm going to focus on just the spatial transcriptomics uh, in the lung that we saw. So this is a H&E staining of one of the biopsy samples um, from a patient. And uh, this actually are two pieces, uh, um, two, two, two sections of the same biopsy uh, stained by H&E. So when feature about uh, COVID-19 is that uh, it's really um, patchy. Um, the clinical features on imaging of COVID-19, if you remember, that this is a patchy ground glass opacity seen at least in the early phase uh, in the periphery of the lung. Um, this is actually quite unique in terms of uh, uh, um, the, the infectious etiologies of the lung. And that if you remember at some point that in Wuhan, they used the imaging criteria to make the diagnosis when the diagnostic kits were not uh, available in large quantities. Um, so it, this shows that even on the single biopsy, you actually can capture regions that has very different degree of uh, uh, disease. In the left, you have relatively normal lung tissue that has a very thin uh, single cell layer of the alveoli epithelial layer. And then on the right, you have a lot of infiltration of inflammatory cells and edemas and maybe fibrosis as well. So the next thing we can do is to stain the tissue with uh, SARS-CoV-2 antibody. And this is an example. And this is obviously not very satisfactory because uh, it's not very quantitative. And you always have concern how specific is the antibody. And antibody, um, in, in this case, we're dealing with a, a a viral protein that it can either be intracellular or extracellular. The other technology that has been quite mature for some time is RNA sexual hybridization that our lab also used a lot in the past for liver research. Um, so this technology basically relies on a RNA probe that uh, is linked to uh, some chemical amplifier that allows you to see that either under line microscopy or you can use uh, uh, fluorescent labels and you can, you can see that under fluorescent microscopy. So this significantly closed the gap for research when, when, when the subject is new and the, the antibody has not been validated well. So when we apply the uh, RNA scope in this case um, to the uh, biopsy sample, this is the same tissue that you saw previously um, here. 
the SARS-CoV-2 viral spike gene was uh, showing in red, and ACE2 is in yellow, and uh, TEMPA-S is in showing green, and the DNA is in blue. You can see the two regions, relatively normal region, as well as the inflamed region uh, on the same sample. If you zoom in, you can see that this uh, layer of a highly packed cells likely is the bronchial epithelium has a lot of viral uh, signal. Whereas uh, right behind that, in the in the in the uh, mesenchymal region, there's a significantly less. The viral density is significantly less. Um, on the left, if you look at the relatively normal region, um, you can also see some viral signals. The viral signals sometimes cluster in regions where you see a uh, infiltration of uh, cells with a very scant uh, cytoplasma, probably indicating these are immune cells. So nanostream GeoMax is really a technology that is very similar to RNA scope that uh, um, go overcomes the barrier of uh, antibody that you can use a RNA probe. But unlike RNA scope that you can only look at two or three genes at a time, you can look at the entire human genome. So here we use the WTA uh, platform, which covers uh, uh, over 18,000 genes. So basically the probes are connected with a UV cleavable key uh, instead of using a, a signal that will amplify um, to, to generate light here, you just count the number of keys to get the quantitative information of the copy of each uh, gene transcript. So this technology can be applied to biopsy tissues. So these are um, tissue biopsy, as you can see the relative size of the each RI that we select um, is a little bit different from the previous uh, talks that you saw from the uh, tissue block, um, from tissue resection. Um, so in this biopsy, these two, two um, um, needle biopsy is actually from the same patient. You can see that it actually covers a wide variety of uh, of a phenotype. There are regions that the alveoli looks relatively normal, whereas there are regions alveoli looks uh, very inflamed, very busy with infiltrative uh, uh, immune cells. You have the bronchial epithelium, and you have regions with alveoli that relatively looks normal, but seems to have edema in the airspace. So the spatial transcriptomics allows us to basically see how these uh, um, regions cluster. So, so we, we analyzed a total of uh, uh, 91 RIs, and one out of these 91 RIs does not meet the minimum number of uh, new, um, cell counts to be, to be successfully analyzed. And uh, uh, we have a total of uh, 18,375 genes, and uh, we were able to have a reliable data on 85% of the genes. So this is a very broad coverage of the transcriptome. And you can immediately see that uh, um, these uh, different ROIs are clustering. Um, on the left, you have the PCA uh, plot, and on the right, you have the SNE plot. And you can see that the distinct uh, cluster is the epithelial uh, cluster, whereas the alveoli clusters inflamed versus normal relatively on a continuum. The other thing we noticed is that uh, there's quite a bit of uh, variability on the transcriptome analysis based on the in individuals. Individuals do cluster, but even within the individual, the normal versus uh, 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 inflamed uh, alveoli um, still separate uh, based on their uh, phenotype. So this is a one analysis of comparing the transcriptome of a bronchial epithelium versus a normal alveoli. So this is sort of served as an internal control to see whether we can actually pick out differences using this uh, um, analysis. And we can see that uh, on the left is the volcano plot, and uh, there's a quite a bit of a, a variance across these two type of RIs. And on the right top, you have the top gene that is related with uh, um, uh, enriched in uh, bronchial epithelium. This is the this is the pathway involved in the old glycan synthesis, which makes total sense. This is what the bronchial epithelium usually do. Whereas uh, in the normal alveoli, the highest ranking uh, pathway is the FLT3. That is the pathway involved in immune regulation, which indicating that in the normal alveoli you have uh, um, more immune cells. So this is the 
analysis that is uh, more telling of the uh, pathology, this is we are comparing the inflamed region, inflamed alveoli versus normal appearing alveoli. And, it, and it, it's, it's quite surprising that you can, you can actually see quite a bit of a variance across these two type of our, our eyes. And uh, the genes that stands out, the top ranking pathway is again, the interferon gamma signaling pathway, which is the same theme that has been uh, discussed previously, seems to be replicated here. That it not not only between high viral count versus low viral count, but here in the same subject subject between the relatively normal appearing versus inflamed regions, the the most prominent pathway is the interferon gamma pathway. Well, as in the normal alveoli, the most prominent pathway is the surfactant producing pathway, which is uh, what normal alveoli will do, indicating that in flame situations, these functions are lost. So this is an analysis comparing um, the our eyes based on the viral count. So we grouped the viral count into three groups, um, low viral count, medium viral count, and high viral count, score zero, one, and a two. So here you have a two by two plot. On the left, you have the normal alveoli. Uh, and on the right, you have the inflamed alveoli. And on the top row, you have score one compared to score zero. And on the bottom row, you have the score two viral counts compared to score zero. So one message we can learn from this is that in the inflamed regions, the amount of viral count does not seem to make a huge difference, which makes biological sense because once the tissue is uh, inflamed, what you're seeing is basically overwhelmed by the inflammatory response. But in the relatively normal regions, comparing regions with a moderate viral count to high viral count, there's a quite a bit of a difference. So on the right, of the genes that is different is a uh, five lipooxygenase. This is a gene involved in the modification of a fatty acids to uh, prostaglycan. And this is uh, um, a pathway involved in inflammation. Finally, this technology also allows us to do cell deconvolution as uh, alluded by other speakers. Um, so here is an example of using a established uh, single cell um, um, reference uh, profile to do deconvolution. And we can see that uh, the clusters demonstrated a different cell composition. On the left is the clustering using the TSME method, and on the right, you can see the deconvolution. And this plot shows the different composition uh, in the pie chart, and uh, the bigger the region indicates uh, the high amount of the um, uh, cells present in that ROI. You can clearly see the cluster that has a lot of orange. That is the bronchial epithelial cluster that has a, a lot of the epithelial cells as well as the ciliated cells. Whereas in the inflamed regions, you can see the blue, the size of the blue is increasing. That is the macrophage. Again, this goes back to the theme that inflammation in COVID-19 patients is associated with an increase of the macrophages. So of course, a lot of analysis are still ongoing and hopefully uh, we'll be able to give you more um, findings from uh, this type of analysis. So with that, I would like to conclude um, my talk and I thank um, the teams involved in this uh, effort. Of course, this is a uh, effort that cannot be done without uh, a huge team uh, to support this. And on the left are the teams involved uh, at the Bacillus Deaconess Medical Center. Uh, Jonas uh, is involved in a lot of the single cell analysis. Um, Jonathan Hatch is our pathologist, has been guided us in the RI selection. Um, I want to specifically thank Olga, who has been collecting the tissues. She's a radiologist, has been getting tissues with uh, a very short window to allow the study to be done using uh, very fresh samples. On the right, we have collaborators from, from our nanostream colleagues. Talon and Jason uh, are the main contributor for the analysis to this point. And uh, Lulio and Yen are involved in our eye selection. Um, Eric, Sara are uh, in instrumental to allow this project to happen. Thank you very much. Thank you so much to all of our speakers for joining us today and sharing their wonderful data. It was it was really exciting to see how uh, we're all taking different profiling strategies to understand and elucidate the biology behind the COVID-19 infection.
I have just a few questions for our panel discussion, uh, and I'm going to ask each of our, our speakers to answer a, a few particular questions. We're going to start off with uh, Rob Schwartz. And Rob, I'm interested to hear how the challenges around sample access have guided the research strategy that you've uh, chosen to take with these COVID-19 tissues. Well, Sarah, I thank you again for the opportunity to participate in this uh, seminar, as well as for the opportunity to collaborate with uh, Nanostring and giving Alan and I um, this uh, wonderful access to this technology. Now, to, to answer your question, um, you know, obviously, uh, sample access is, you know, has and remains to be a, a major challenge uh, here. Um, and I think across the United States. Now, with that said, I mean, we have amassed uh, an autopsy, a large autopsy series. And I think, you know, one of the challenges I think is the overall variability that's present within the, the tissues themselves. And what I mean by that is that some of the patients died very early on in their disease course um, after having been infected. And so those patients, uh, as we've learned over time, have very high viral loads as compared to patients who died later in their uh, disease course. And so that's not something that we knew initially when we were selecting uh, samples for uh, tissue analysis and for, um, you know, for the uh, GeoMex uh, spatial analysis. And I think that's, um, you know, you know, initially uh, created some uh, challenge um, in the analysis of these tissues. Now we've been able to go back and add back kind of those tissues that we know now are, you know, are very rich in SARS-CoV-2 uh, viral transcripts and are more representative of this uh, earlier cohort uh, of disease. Thank you, Rob. Um, and I wanted to direct the same question to Gordon because I know that he, you know, he mentioned in his presentation as well some of the challenges and strategies that the Beth Israel team had put in place. Yeah, thank you, Sarah, to have the opportunity to um, to, to join this uh, exciting uh, forum and always the exciting uh, investigators. Um, so, uh, so back to your question about the sample access, um, I think this is a learning process. We sort of uh, learned about uh, the challenge in this particular project and learned about the advantage of uh, this platform. For the COVID project initially, you know, nobody knows about uh, um, how, to, how, to, how to do the safety controls and, uh, and there's a little bit of challenge how to do that safely. So we, we, we sort of go around the uh, uh, biopsy approach rather than getting the actual organ, which will require um, a, a tissue dissection. Um, so what we learned from this study is that uh, this technology actually works pretty well on biopsy samples. This actually is a very interesting thing that because uh, um, clinically biopsy is the most common way that uh, clinicians get tissue. And if a technology is uh, compatible with uh, biopsy samples, this will greatly uh, open up opportunities for for research on existing samples, samples that has been banked in, in clinical studies and a situation like that. Um, obviously, you know, the cutting edge um, transcriptomics te te techniques has allowed us to really learn a lot, but a lot of these techniques require samples that are fresh. And uh, once you fix that, it makes things much harder. Um, and this technology, um, allows you to work on samples that has been fixed and that is widely available on uh, um, formerly fixed uh, uh, paraffin embedded tissue, which I think is a huge advantage. Thank you so much, Gordon. I'm going to turn my next question to Asa. And Asa, I was really interested to hear about your experiences with doing ROI selection because you have access to an instrument at your own site. Can you speak a little bit about what that process was like for you? Sure. All right. So yeah, it's been a very interesting process and we have been multiple people involved in the ROI selection. And what we've done is that we have pretty much one, one great feature about the DSP machine is that you, you can remotely access it from various locations. So we have had two pathologists logging onto the machine and then on over Zoom, we have discussed like individual slides over multiple different Zoom events. And uh, yeah, during the afternoon where we place the ROIs and it's been an ongoing 
like very lively discussion about where to put them and what areas to sample and so on. So, and that is really what takes time with a DSP machine, definitely. And also to get the segmentation adjustments to correctly give you the, the best areas and so on. Perfect, so, thank you. It sounds like a very engaging process. It is. Uh, and then one, one question then to Alan, please. Once, um, once we've done the visualizations, once we've collected the data, what have you learned about data visualization throughout, um, throughout these experiments? What's worked well? What do we still need to do uh, in general to, to help bring these images and these molecular data to life and make them uh, as interpretable as possible? Well, I, I find that the, um, the visualizations, especially by cell type, and expression by cell type is immensely valuable, especially as it's geographically related to the section. Because we, as the pathologists, have seen the section, we've seen the individual cells, we've imagined what they are, but when we see them uh, confirmed in this way, and then we can get expression at, even within the different areas of the tissue, it, it's extremely valuable visualization, I, I found. I think the biggest challenge that we encountered is just the heterogeneity of the samples themselves and, and being able to establish a proper baseline, that, that remains mm -hmm. a challenge. Truly normal tissue is, is, is hard to come by. Perfect, thanks so much, and I, I agree with you. It's, it's, it's uh, great to see the underlying biology really coming through in the data, but it does present some, uh, some challenges to overcome in terms of how we think about interpreting it. Um, so we're out of time today. Uh, another round of thanks to all of our speakers. They were fantastic presentations. Uh, thank you to our audience, too, for joining and listening. I hope that you have enjoyed the track and you enjoyed the rest of the uh, Spatial Biology Conference. It was wonderful to be spend this time with you today.